Welcome everyone to the Cube's con to the Cube's live coverage of MWISE here in Washington D.C. I'm your host Rebecca Knight, alongside my host and analyst John Furrier. Yeah. Great to be back here with Great you. Great to see you. And today we are joined by Brian Dye. He is the CEO of Corelight. He's in from San Francisco. Welcome, Brian. Thank you, Rebecca. Great to be here. So the news hit the wires this morning. This expanded partnership between Corelight and Mandiant. Tell our viewers a little bit more about this amplified partnership. Yeah, it's really got two big parts to do. Uh, number one, what is Mandiant using Corelight technology for, and what, how is Corelight integrated into Mandiant and Google proper technology? So, the, for the uh, Mandiant uh, professional services team, their instant responders, they have the ability to use Corelight technology in their instant response engagement and in their managed defense services. And we'll talk about that why and more in the future. And then for Corelight, we've more deeply integrated our technology into a bunch of parts of the Google platform not just the Chronicle Security Operations Suite and the Mandiant Threat Intelligence Services, <clears throat> but also the GCP packet mirroring services as well. There's a lot of talk about shared responsibility. You see all the attacks, the MGM thing was in the news all this week, and we were actually there at an event uh, when it was happening. Elevators, half the banks were gone. I mean, complete disruption. I mean, this is the ransomware problem. There's so many seams now. Detection, response, What's, what's the answer? I mean, you guys are in the middle of this right now. There's so much activity going on. This marketplace is, is brutal and it, we need answers. What's the, how do you guys see that and where do you guys connect and how does the partnership help uh, yeah, companies I mean, be more secure because this is code red. It, it is code red, and I think what you're seeing is, is a dramatic bifurcation of the threat landscape. You've got situations like ransomware that are incredibly fast, incredibly destructive, but then you've got the advanced threat actors that are still actually incredibly quiet, incredibly slow and long. So what we really see organizations doing is kind of doubling down on four big areas, right? They need endpoint, they need identity, they need uh, cloud, and they need threat, uh, network. And what those really represent is a balance of depth versus breadth in how you get the right intelligence to go and find these advanced attackers, especially when what you're essentially doing is looking back in time, right? Take MGM, right? And, and I wish everyone there the best. They're wrestling with a really hard problem right now. They are trying to look back and figure out, are they diagnosing a problem from a week, a month, a quarter, or a year? Like that's your step one problem. And so you need this balance of depth versus breadth in your insight. And again, that's that same mentality is actually behind the Corelight uh, Mandiant partnership. So can you give our viewers an example of how this partnership works and what it entails? Yeah, so the, and, and it really comes down to thinking about the world not as a technologist, but really as an instant responder. And so let me walk you through an example that's not MGM, certainly the, pub, the details on that are not publicly known, but actually one of my first uh, interviews, uh, research interviews when I joined Corelight was with a consultant here at Mandiant. And I said, hey look, I'm, treat me like I'm an idiot. Why does this <laughs> network data matter so much for you? Like what's useful here? And he, and he walked me through this story. He said, look, uh, one of his earlier engagements was a multi-thousand uh, uh, entity franchise organization, right? And so they're incredibly large. They got notified by Visa that they were compromised. Step one, which couple hundred endpoints do you go worry about, these point of sale terminals, when you've got 10,000 plus franchise locations? So the network tends to have this great role of helping prioritize your overall investigation. So they went, they prioritized, now you flip back to endpoint. All right, let's go instrument those point of sale terminals, let's find out where the malware is, great. Once you find the malware, now you're back to the network, because how did that malware get there? You've got to reverse track the entire kill chain, right? What was the lateral movement? What was the command and control? What was the point of incursion? So the network tends to be fantastic to accelerate that instant response process. Third, now that you think you've got the attack, how do you actually get rid of it? There's a bunch of rebuilding individual servers. Once you think you've got it out, how do you prove that, there, that none of that activity is recurring? Right? The network tends to be the source of ground truth for that. And the last piece that frankly I thought was most interesting is he said, never forget that there might have been 15, 16 consultants from Mandy working this thing super aggressively for six or eight weeks. And folks worry about how expensive that is. That's nothing. Because when those 15 or 16 people leave, one or two of them stay and they get joined by three or four lawyers and the lawyers stay for the next three months, months while you're trying to figure out what defensible disclosure is for that organization. So it turns out the network not just provides you connectivity to connect the dots across this, across all this, but it gives you ground truth yeah. of what's really happening. And that defensible ground truth that can stand up to the audit committee, for example, tends to be really important. I like, I like the ground truth, network being the ground truth angle because it's like the footprints are in the network. You can follow the packets. You can't hide, when you're moving around, you can't hide, so that's always, we heard that before. But it's getting complicated now, you get all these endpoints, cloud is involved. 
And connectivity's increasing. So you got edge emerging uh, with AI here, and the data's everywhere. Is it a data problem? Is it a network problem? How do you guys look at the new sprawl of data, networks, when you look at the problems to attack that from the defending side, of course, speed, speed's a factor. So you got increased role of data, budgets aren't increasing 10x. So how does a, a practitioner think of this through when they yeah. go look at this? Yeah, it's, it's, a really, it's a really good one because all of those things are not created equal and how do you prioritize them, right? We often find defenders are kind of thinking about just like there's the attacker advantage, right? Where they only have to win once and the defender has to get it right every time. There's actually a defender advantage where you, you want to position yourselves and focus your efforts where the, you have multiple chances to get the attacker, right? Those tend to be reconnaissance, command and control, lateral movement, right? To, to use mm -hmm. the kill chain stages. So that's a, really where we see things playing out. And then if you think about the role of data, the, the thing that we see folks focusing on is, A, all data is not create equal, and B, you have to actually start thinking not just about data, but about time, yeah. right? How much time coverage do you have looking backwards to go find what the issue was, right? Think about log 4 shell really big issue. How long could you look back and figure out where that was in your environment three months ago, six months ago, nine months ago, right, when that vulnerability yeah. might have been, in, been exploited? So those are the two big and ones. Then, and also storage, how long do you store it for? How is it available? What's AI have access to it? Is there automation? These are all the questions that come up. And I got to ask you, because this comes up a lot, we're going to talk a lot about here at this event and, and certainly the rest of the year and ongoing. Threat detection is like a you know, first responder. Go figure out what happened. But now you've got the more holistic operating system view of, of networks. You're in networks, so you got to look at a bigger picture. You mentioned a little bit of how big that is. I'd love to get your feelings on how big that truly is. But how do you look at that and, and balance the holistic view versus jump in and just send a SWAT team or you know, a response team at something? Because you, you got to look at the detection. Got to throw, throw a blanket on that right away. But zooming out, time, how far back do you go, where's the data stored, that's going to require architecture. It, it is, and I think what, what folks are starting to realize pretty aggressively here is it's not an or, it's an and, right? You absolutely need detections. You need kind of live threat detections, you need anomalies, you need all the things that are going to enable not just your initial instant response, but follow on threat hunting programs, that's really critical. But then the, the broad-based view of the data becomes really important because you've got living off the land, right? You've got a bunch of stealthy techniques that folks are being used that will not and cannot actually drive detections, right? You're not going to alert on PowerShell just because there's PowerShell within an organization, <laughs> right? There's PowerShell everywhere. That's, <laughs> that's, not, that's yeah. not the problem. Who's using PowerShell incorrectly is actually the problem. So we, we kind of think of it in, in a couple of layers. One is what uh, Kevin Mandy actually recently called second stage detections, right? Where you have an incursion from an actor that, that looks like they're doing nothing unusual, but then you have a whole bunch of very unusual leading to malicious activity afterwards. So it changes the shape of what you're looking for, right? That becomes one big one. Um, the second big one becomes really thinking about this time coverage piece that we've talked about already, right? How much can you actually look back, right? Uh, and the third, in, in a really, really big way, is how do you actually think about, um, um, sorry, uh, me, uh, enabling threat hunting programs? Because you talked about this balance between the attacker uh, and the time. What a threat hunting team is going to do, even, and even if it's not team, by yeah. the way, even if it's just giving your higher end instant responders a few hours on Friday to go and do threat hunting, they will potentially find bad things in your network live. If they don't find bad things, they're probably going to find policy violations. And if they find nothing, now they know your environment better. Right? There's a great Rob Joyce quote from years ago, right? When, back when he was running tailored access operations, where he got up and said, your number one obligation is to know your network because we will. Yeah, yeah. Right? And that's the attacker's viewpoint. So we're really living in a time where ransomware attacks and security breaches are, uh, are an inevitable part of doing business right now. But what is what is going on in the in in the moment? What is about this uh, this particular moment in time that makes your partnership so important? So I think there's a couple things that are behind it. Number one, there's been a and actually a bunch of Mandiant's own research uh, has highlighted this. If you look across the different geographies, there's actually very very different drivers for the initial incursion. Right, you know, phishing and social engineering continues to be very big, but there's actually been, especially because the number of, unfortunately, network-based vulnerabilities that have been disclosed over the past year has never been higher, right? If you look at the last five years, the last 12 months, we've seen more broad-based network vulnerabilities than ever. So you've got more ways to get into an organization undetected. 
once you're in undetected, we're back to this depth of breadth problem, right? If you're in undetected, that means the perimeter defense, the detection engine has by definition been bypassed, right? It's not solar winds. I mean, that was a super aggressive way to do this, but a classic network vulnerability yeah. for either router switch or, you know, heaven forbid, firewalls or VPN devices, which we've seen a lot of in the past year, that becomes a really big problem. So now it puts a lot more focus and weight on the raw network, uh, both for the network evidence and the network-based detections, to find those follow-on indicators of compromise, those follow-on attack signals. And I think that's been the biggest thing in the landscape over the past year especially. Can you talk about dwell time? This comes up a lot. You kind of mentioned a little bit on the defender side. What's the definition of dwell time in security context? And why is it important to understand that? Yeah, dwell time for us, and again, Mandiant has great uh, research on metrics, right? There's a, for folks that don't know across your, view, your viewership, uh, there's a, a set of metrics they use called drain cover, drain CVR, technically, D-R-A-I-N, CVR. There's some research, you can Google it, that kind of does a really nice walkthrough of kind of each of these metrics and why they matter. But at a simple level, dwell time is a measure of how long that attacker's been in your environment before you found them. And so, A, that's essentially your exposure. How long did they get to recon? How long did they get to find their payloads? How much exfiltration time did they actually have before you found it, right? Are you actually left a bang, right? To use the exfil analogy yeah. or yeah. not. And then second, can you even see the beginning of that? Right, if, you, if, if they've been in there so long that you can't find the beginning of it, now you put everything else in your instant, uh, instant response process at risk because you're not truly sure whether you found the full scope of that attack, contained them, and eliminated the threat. Right, if they've been in there longer than you have the visibility for. But that's, you know, dwell and time the, in And that gives you the range of how bad it is, basically. Yes. If they've been there for a while, you're like, oh man, what's <laughs> going on? And that's kind of what happened with MGM. They were already in there and they did some damage and then kind of when they were detected, that's when they encrypted, went to the ransomware move, uh, this kind of early reports coming out. Not yet clear, but clear that the disruption there. I mean, just generally zooming out, a lot of people see a, the AI trend, they see the security trends. There's almost like, and I, and I hate to say this word on camera because I, I, I don't believe it, there's a doom and gloom mentality. People are scared, they don't know what to do. Uh, I think it's a little bit overblown by a mile, personally, but the unknown scares people. What's the truth when it comes to security and AI? What's real, what's not real? What should people pay attention to? Um, how should companies defend themselves? I mean, I mean, it's a, it's a free for all. Like, where's the government helping? So, I mean, there's a lot in there, but you know, feel free to oh, share. Plenty for us to riff on on yeah, this one. Let's there's riff there's on a lot this. here. So, just to get us going, I think there's kind of three layers here. There's what are the attackers doing? What are the organizations doing? What are the defenders doing? Yeah. And, and happy to come back to this because we've seen some fascinating things both within our customers and within the open source community. But you know, what are the attackers doing? They're doing the same thing the defenders are doing, right? They're actually using AI to automate their, uh, their attacking and their code development, by the way. So they're getting faster. Right, the, uh, one of our uh, partners made the comment that with AI, the incremental cost of labor has gone down, right? Everyone gets more productive. And unfortunately, that includes the attackers, right? So they're doing that. What are, the def what are the organizations doing? They're trying to figure out what exposure do I have? What policy should I put in place? And how are people even using this stuff? And that is all over the map right now because you've got some early adopters that are being very aggressive. You've got some folks that are just outright banning it in their organizations, right? So you've got a huge spread there. And the defenders, I think, are actually being really, really smart about this. Uh, the folks that we talk to, and again, we, we have the privilege to serve some really, really elite missions, right? We're a bizarrely kind of high-end focused organization from that perspective. Um, we see defenders already going in and saying, help me translate alerts into English. That's simple, practical, valuable, doesn't incur hallucinations in these other AI problems. What is the wisdom of the crowds of how I would start investigating the following things, right? If I've got distributed DNS exfiltration, where do I begin? But they also know that after that, you have to kind of stop. Because the Gen AI, remember, it's predicting the next letter of an answer for <laughs> it's you. It's right? generating stuff. It's <laughs> generating stuff, right? It's actually not good at generating like interesting detective hypothesis. This is way, <laughs> way too hard of a problem yeah. to ask a Gen AI machine. So if you go down the wisdom of the crowds and it doesn't work, it's back on you yeah. as, a, as an instant responder, as a defender. The Gen AI, you get a massive spike in hallucinations, you get a massive spike in just bad advice, yeah. and a bunch of well, stuff. Well, the human in the loop is critical here because then that's the expertise that's being augmented and the heavy lifting from AI facilitates the human to be better. So when, when they get better, what's next? What's so some reasoning happens on the human level. Are there other AI techniques coming or there to go to the next level? I mean, we've seen this in chess, well documented humans plus computers against computers, humans plus AI is better than AI by itself, we've seen that. Where's this profession go next? Because 
I'm just thinking there's going to be a creative class emerging out of in the cyber around how to defend and attack counterattack or countermeasures. There 100% is, and I think it's important to realize that the defender and the defender's needs is not a one size fits all, right? So let's kind of break this down a little bit. You've got incredibly high end defenders from very large organizations, right? Hundreds, maybe even thousands of people uh, that are actually just in the InfoSec team or maybe even just in the SOC. They've got one set of needs. Let's contrast that if you've got maybe five or 10 people in your security team and you're trying to cover the same scope as what those incredibly elite defenders are doing. So I think the answer of what's next on Gen AI is a little bit different for those two groups. Mm -hmm. In the really high end, we see folks already doing um, alert translation, doing investigation guidance, even doing like taking SIM queries and, and doing draft SIM queries using the Gen AI, right? And I think frankly there's going to be incredibly broad adoption across the technology landscape of AI accelerated workflows and yeah. security to serve kind of those high end needs. I think there's going to be a tremendous amount of that. And that stage two thing you mentioned earlier also can be automated, the detection there is another good point. I got to ask you about the use cases. Uh, obviously we're kind of seeing AI as that third inflection point, web, mobile, uh, AI, that changes the app environment, the underlying infrastructure, and the user experience expectation on, on good, bad, and ugly. As AI comes out, you're seeing things like vishing, voice phishing, as, as, as popular. Now you're going to see voice activation. Now you have all these new ways to social engineer. I mean, a lot of the companies coming out of the MGM and others is that the LinkedIn is a great environment to get that kind of you know, identity-based bait and switch, and then the social engineer, and then you get vishing, voice phishing. <laughs> What's next? What's the next? Ha I mean, this is <laughs> like a whole nother yeah, level. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, a whole yeah. nother level. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's next level. It is, it, and it's going. I think it's going to continue the speed problem, right? And and th again, the paradox, right? We talked about this dwell time challenge earlier of ransomware that's super fast and destructive, and the APT stuff that's super slow and, and kind of sinister, right? And so take that into the Gen AI and like the uh, image generation, the voice generation, exactly what you're saying. Where that's all going to accelerate the pace and the speed of yeah. attack development it's not necessarily going to create new attack types. It's yeah. going to accelerate the development of the existing ones, right? So now we're going to get kind of these two things, right? We're going to get things like ransomware that phishing effectiveness and, and vishing and everything, we're, we're having to invent new acronyms. That's never yeah. a good <laughs> thing, right? Yeah. Uh, it's going to accelerate there. So then you need defenders. They're going to focus on how can I actually radically improve the speed of response of my yeah. tier one and the automation of my tier one against these common but very fast attack types. So I think it puts a tremendous premium on speed. You're going to get the other thing too though, yeah. because if you can accelerate the attack development, you can accelerate all your attack developments. Yeah. So I, I spoke to a CISO last year that had a really interesting strategy that, that kind of followed this twofold punch. He said he has two, one strategy that is, I need to be able to respond to routine threats in six seconds. Six seconds. Right, mm -hmm. that is fully automated, zero touch. Right, yeah. you know, you can ref you can use AI productively in this case. Right, AI yeah. plus the automation platforms mm -hmm. plus the sims, everything else. You can drive that. But on the other end, he said, look at the kill chain. I want to go focus on lateral movement, and I want to take that stage of the kill chain, and I want to identify and drive to zero every vulnerability in lateral movement, because that's actually where I get defender advantage, it's where I get most ability to see what the attacker's doing, I get the most bites at the apple, and if I can truncate that, if I can, kill, if I can cut the kill chain right there, I buy myself the most time to find that attacker kind of in the rest of the kill chain. So I think it comes yeah. down, as the, as the Gen, AI, Gen AI continues to kind of amplify in power, you're yeah. going to get attack velocity by, by the attackers, and that means yeah. the defenders have to almost get bipolar, right? And I mean that in a good sense of yeah. the word. And the thing, the thing about IT, Dave Vellante and I talked about, Rick, Rebecca and I were just talking before we came on camera about the personnel, the, the workforce. The pace of play in security is so fast. I mean, you look at old traditional IT, if, you, if you're an organization, and you were school, your education, I mean, these, they have like old school IT environments. That's why they're getting hit with the ransomware, low hanging fruit for the, for the hackers. But the pace of play is so high, the budgets aren't increasing 10X, the talent pool's not increasing 10X, the data's increasing 10X plus, some say more. The hackers are increasing in groups and organized yep. crime units at multiple levels. What's the answer on the personnel front? 
Well, I think it's a couple things. Number one, I think constructively using Gen AI to offload the, the lower value, you know, kind of more routine stuff from your team, that both gives them time to focus on the more advanced topics and frankly gives them time to train and learn the environment. This is the, the, such the core issue. To your point, pace, let's, go, let, let's ignore that super high-end organization for a second. Let's come back to a team that might have five or 10 or 15 people in their security function, yeah. they're trying to cover an entire enterprise, all the different cloud services, all the different endpoints, network combination, zero trust, you name, pick your buzzword and throw it all in the soup and mix it up, right? Those folks have a shockingly hard problem because they have the same attacker profile, the same kind of savvy, but they've got to be jack of all trades and master of them all. So if we can use the Gen AI pieces to kind of offload and automate a huge chunk of that, te of that team's yeah. routine work, <laughs> so they can actually just breathe, catch up a little bit, yeah. and then that'll enable them to do some of the threat hunting. Uh, and you know, you and I were talking b before we got live, like what's, what's the kind of thing that I worry about in the background? It comes back to the government regulation question because yeah. there is a bunch of appropriate concern around how do you take you know, what is essentially dynamite and make sure that we're kind of you know, uh, uh, making tunnels and not blowing people's yeah. hands off, right? That yeah. horrible analogy, but you know, let, yeah. let's make sure the tools used appropriately. But we've got this massive mismatch between the speed of the legislati legislative engine and the speed of not just cyber, yeah. which has always been a problem, but the speed of tech development and AI. So how do we hit that balance where we're providing some guardrails around this balance. thing, so that, but let's solve the problem, right? It's not <laughs> a new yeah. problem. It's, it's not a new problem, exactly. yeah. The regulation's BS in my opinion because one, they can never get the speed, number one. Two, it's emerging too fast. They got to let it run, let chaos reign, reign in the chaos as Andy Groves famously said at one point. There's enough guardrails in place. And again, it's not like the government's helping companies. They have to hire their own militia, AKA the security department, not the IT department. So, I mean, it's a, it's a wild west right now. It's really, regulation I think would kind of hurt things in my opinion. It would, I think it would be incredibly hard, it's incredibly hard to regulate something that you don't really w understand, and I think very few people truly understand what's going on, and the state of that changes every three to yeah. six months, right, which is fantastic. And I th again, I think, uh, uh, in terms of bets, I think if you've got a material player in cyber that doesn't have an AI-based kind of offering or integration by the end of this calendar year, right, so it's what, three and a half months left, yeah. Uh, then they're either drunk or asleep at the wheel. Yeah. I mean, and when things are moving that fast, when you've got fairly nimble, fairly technically agile yeah. team is focused on uh, exploiting, and I mean that in a good way, the capabilities of technology, and you compare that to the regulatory apparatus, yeah. like they're, they're trying to figure out what the practitioners knew a year ago. That's kind of the state of research, yeah, which lag. I think is just, it's normal, right? So that's just, it's an impedance yeah. mismatch. We got to figure out our way through. It's all ex exceedingly complex. Yes, yes. Well, Brian, thank you so much for coming on theCUBE. It's been a really interesting yeah. conversation. Thanks for having me, I really enjoyed it. Thank you much. Thank you. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of MWISE. I'm Rebecca Knight for John Furrier. Stay tuned.